Welcome to the latest episode of British History, Royals, Rebels, and Romantics, the podcast for people who understand that history shows us what's possible for us in our lives today. I'm Carol Ann Lloyd, your host and tour guide as we travel back in time. We're shaking up history to look at the stories that don't always make the history books, to consider famous and infamous characters in new and interesting ways, and to look for all the things that we share even when we're living in different times and places. I hope you enjoy this journey through the royals, rebels, and romantics of Britain. Now, let's explore history together. Hello, history lovers. For today's journey to the past, we're going to take a look at one of the surprising Brits throwing fits. Although we typically think of her as a sedate widow, the essence of respectability, the symbol of propriety, and, quite frankly, the last person in the world who would ever think of throwing a fit, Queen Victoria had her share of royal tantrums. This was especially true early in her reign. In fact, 1839 turned out to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad year for the Queen at least until October. There was joy when the 18-year-old Princess Victoria became Queen of England in 1837. The entire country seemed to be in love with the young monarch. Her predecessor, William IV, had predicted, quote, it will touch every sailor's heart to have a girl queen to fight for. They'll be tattooing her face on their arms, end quote. Victoria was the youngest queen England had ever known. It had been more than a hundred years since last a queen had been ruler of the country. There was anticipation and speculation about how this young woman would manage her responsibilities. Her privy council was called immediately, and her first session was a triumph. She charmed the older men, much to their surprise, and their enthusiasm for her seemed unanimous and endless. As a single reigning queen, Victoria was confident. She embraced the opportunity to serve her country, something she had been anticipating for years. She happily cast off the stifling influence of her mother, the Duchess of Kent, and Sir John Conroy. She exhibited self-reliance in the face of their disapproval and anger. But these two people would become central to some of the most terrible scandals of her early reign. Back in 1834, three years before Victoria became queen, Lady Flora Hastings was appointed lady-in-waiting to the Duchess of Kent. Lady Flora was really brought in to be Victoria's companion and limit her time with her governess, Baroness Leitzen. Victoria was extremely close to Leitzen, and the princess's governess and mother hated each other. Conroy also hated Leitzen. When Victoria became queen in 1837, Lady Flora remained part of the Duchess's household. In January 1839, Flora traveled with John Conroy back to London after a visit to her family in Scotland. She had been ill for weeks with a painful swollen stomach. When she got to London, Lady Flora consulted with the court physician, Sir James Clark. He prescribed medicine that had no effect. Even so, she seemed to get a little better. However, the swelling in her stomach had been noticed by some of the Queen's ladies. Apparently, they reported this to the Queen, who recorded in her journal that she was, quote, exceedingly suspicious that Flora was with child. Apparently, Dr. Clark didn't confirm the pregnancy, but he didn't rule it out either. Victoria imagined the father to be none other than Conroy. Lady Flora became a focus for the factions of the Queen's court. Flora exercised her sharp wit at the expense of Leitzen, which increased Victoria's dislike. Lord Melbourne, highly loyal to the Queen, called Lady Flora nasty and ugly. This seeped into a political sphere as well, as the Hastings family were Tories and Melbourne was a Whig. Victoria strongly supported Melbourne and the Whigs. 
After weeks of gossip and accusations, Clark went to Lady Flora and told her if she were not secretly married, she must marry immediately and confess her sin. Flora continued to deny she was pregnant and insisted she was ill. Dr. Clark then shared the Queen's requirement that Flora would be banned from court unless she submitted to an invasive examination. Lady Flora had no option but to submit. Sir James Clark and the Hastings family doctor, Sir Charles Clark, were there, and Victoria's supporter, Lady Portman, was also present. Lady Flora's maid was also allowed to be there. After the examination, both doctors signed a certificate stating there were no grounds for belief there had ever been a pregnancy. The forced examination was a shocking error. Afterwards, the Queen sent an apologetic note to Lady Flora, who was very ill. Victoria wished to put the whole event be behind her, of course, and hoped Lady Flora would be willing to do so. Although Lady Flora accepted the Queen's apology, she stated she hoped she would be the last member of the Hastings family to be so wrongly treated and stated that she felt she had been treated as if guilty of a crime without a trial. Even after all this, Dr. Clark still seemed willing to believe Lady Flora might be pregnant. He was not punished or relieved of his duties for these falsehoods. Lord Melbourne did little or nothing to lessen the scandal, which continued to hold the fascination of the press and the public. Queen Victoria was opposed to her mother's household anyway and refused to make any effort to heal the rift with Lady Flora. This episode drew Victoria's youth, immaturity, and inexperience into sharp focus. The Queen was shown to be unable to set her personal feelings aside to make fair judgments. And Lord Melbourne, who should have advised her to make better choices, instead went along with and encouraged the Queen's unfounded suspicions. Eventually, Lady Flora's mother appealed to the Queen through the Duchess. She wrote a detailed letter reminding Victoria that as a female sovereign, she was looked to by women of Britain for sympathy and support. But the Queen refused to show any for Lady Flora. She sent the letter back to her mother without a word. This was a mistake as it led the Hastings family to take matters into their own hands and attempt to expose the royal court and demand accountability for the harm experienced by their family member. The Hastings family asked for a public apology and for Sir James Clark to be dismissed as the Queen's physician. Lord Hastings threatened to raise the subject in the House of Lords, but Victoria and her government did not agree to these terms and they told the Hastings family that raising the subject in the House of Lords would be seen as an attack on the throne. The Hastings decided their only option was appealing to the public through the press. Lady Flora wrote a detailed letter to her uncle describing everything that had happened. She praised the Duchess and mentioned the Queen's apology. She ended the letter by saying, quote, I blush to send you so revolting a letter, but I wish you to know the truth. End quote. She invited her uncle to share the information if he wished. This he did, sending it to the examiner for publication. Politics was still just below the surface. The Whigs believed the scandal was being flamed for political purposes. They blamed the Tories for casting aspersions on an unmarried queen. The Tories thought Melbourne was to blame and questioned the level of the queen's reliance on him. And Victoria had no real understanding of how her closeness to Melbourne was compromising her reign. This closeness with Melbourne took Victoria into another crisis while the Lady Flora episode continued. Melbourne was dealt a devastating political blow when his government passed a bill that would have enforced anti-slavery legislation by only five votes. This narrow margin undermined his leadership. On May 7th, Melbourne met with the Queen to explain he would resign and suggest that she call the Duke of Wellington and Sir Robert Peel. He told her to trust them, but with caution. 
The queen did not like Peel, who was very different from her beloved Melbourne. One of the things Peel requested was that she remove some of her ladies-in-waiting. Melbourne had influenced Victoria's selection of the ladies who would serve in her household, and Victoria wanted to keep them. Peel, however, understood the political ramifications of the women who had the Queen's ear. Victoria's bedchamber was filled with women with Whig sympathies, and he sought to establish a more receptive political climate. But Victoria would not budge. She felt Peel was attempting to influence her personal choices in an outrageous way. These were her friends, and they had been loyal to her during the Lady Flora crisis. She was determined to be loyal to them. Why should she send them away, simply because the government had changed? The Queen insisted her ladies were not politicians, and she repeatedly pointed out that this had never happened before. But, as Peel understood, in the hundred-plus years since Queen Anne's reign, the role of the monarch in relationship to the Prime Minister and Parliament had changed. But Victoria was unmoved. Finally, Peel bluntly told Victoria if she did not at least remove the ladies who were married to his harshest critics, he could not form a government. She told him she would give him her final decision in a few hours. Victoria quickly wrote to Melbourne in his cabinet and explained her behavior this way, quote, They wanted to deprive me of my ladies, and I suppose they would deprive me next of my dressers and my housemaids. They wish to treat me like a girl, but I will show them that I am the Queen of England, end quote. Nothing could make her see how inappropriate her behavior was. In the face of the Queen's refusal, Peel resigned on May 10th. Victoria was thrilled and celebrated late into the evening. She managed to convince Melbourne to retain his position. This brought stability back into her world. But as time went on, Victoria began to feel uneasy. The public was outraged at these developments. The Duke of Wellington and Peel were very put out. Melbourne's loyalty had been misapplied. He should have helped the Queen understand her role and that Peel's request was political in nature. His wish to have wife of the wives of the Tory MPs in the Queen's household was a reasonable one. Eventually, Victoria did ask Melbourne to help her quietly bring one Tory lady into the household. Toward the end of her life, Victoria looked back on this misstep with regret. Blaming her young age... She said it was a learning opportunity and insisted she never would have acted that way again. Still, she admitted, it was a mistake. At the time that she was going through this, Lady Flora was getting more and more ill. Public sympathy was with her entirely. The Duchess of Kent was sure Lady Flora was dying, but Victoria would still not show any sympathy. Her journal entries are full of complaints about Lady Flora's impertinence and still round stomach. Even as the Duchess repeatedly asked her daughter to speak or at least light, write to Lady Flora, Victoria insisted there was no need. But eventually the Queen relented. Perhaps she had a bit of pause after the bedchamber scandal. Toward the end of June, Victoria visited Lady Flora and was shocked to see how truly ill she was. She didn't stay long and began to hope that Lady Flora would recover. However, Flora Hastings died on July 5th. In her death, Lady Flora made a final attempt to clear her name and reclaim her honor. She asked that a post-mortem be conducted on her body to prove her chastity and the innocence of those rumors that were circulating including the one she had died from a botched abortion. The autopsy clearly stated that Lady Flora Hastings had died from an enlarged liver that had been pushing on her stomach. It also stated emphatically that doctors found her to be a virgin. Queen Victoria and Melbourne were vilified by the public. The Duchess said the Queen did not even know her country, and in this case she seemed to be right. Victoria had not been thinking of her country in either of the challenges that she faced in the first half of 1839. She was thinking only of herself. 
Her personal feelings about her mother and John Conroy led her to act out some of that anger on Flora Hastings, jumping to the worst and wholly unfounded conclusion about Lady Flora. She thought the ladies Melbourne had helped her choose for her bedchamber were her friends and wished to keep them, and Melbourne both, even though political reality demanded that she make and accept changes. Victoria's reputation suffered. Some reporters even accused Victoria's court of murder in the death of Lady Flora. Many blamed the Queen directly for Lady Flora's death. As crowds gathered to pay their respects to the casket of the young woman, some cried aloud the Queen was to blame. There were even a few who threw rocks at the royal carriage as Victoria rode by. Victoria's very suitability as queen was in question. She was challenged for being young, inexperienced, and overly emotional. Thousands of people attended Lady Flora's funeral. She became a martyr and rallying cry for the Tories. Melbourne was blamed along with Victoria, and people were starting to call for change. A political magazine said that if the English court did not change, there can be no safety for the life, for the happiness, or for the reputation of the Queen in England. Victoria was despondent. She had been trying to prove she was Queen, to exercise her influence, and demonstrate her ability to reign. Instead, she had acted out of spite and selfishness, and had seen the country turn against her. Her joyful and successful coronation must have seemed a world away. In the fall of that same year, 1839, Victoria would have a final opportunity to make a decision that would affect the future of her reign. Everything would change on October 10th. And that's a story for another day. Thank you for joining me to experience Queen Victoria's very bad year. Please join me next time to watch Shakespeare and the Earl of Essex Join our gang of Brits throwing fits. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please share with a friend. Do send any questions or comments. I'd love to hear from you where we should explore next. And please subscribe and leave a review. I'd really appreciate it. I'm so glad we could explore history together. Till next time. (laughs) 